Hello everyone, welcome to our new series, The Lightbulb Sessions. The Great British Entrepreneur Awards in association with BT Skills for Tomorrow have designed a free live stream series, The Lightbulb Sessions, to support small businesses and entrepreneurs with insightful and advice driven sessions, featuring some of the UK's brilliant entrepreneurial minds to illuminate your path to entrepreneurial success. You can find out more about BT Skills for Tomorrow by heading to their website at www bt.com forward slash skills for tomorrow or by clicking on the link in the comment section. In today's session, Great Bridge Entrepreneur Awards Head of Content Jonathan Davis will speak with co-founder and creative director of the Clerkenwell Brothers, Faraz Agiai. This session will offer top tips on building a brand narrative, how to set a brilliant brief when developing a brand and we'll look into the journey from brand narrative to visualization. Faraz will be talking about a good brand ID and what doesn't, how you can develop a brand world beyond a corporate ID and what your next steps need to be once the brand is complete. There is an opportunity to ask questions during the session. If you have a question you'd like to ask, you can pop this in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to get to them throughout the session. And with that, I'll pass over to our host today, Jonathan Davis. Yeah, thanks Chloe um, and welcome to everyone who joined us today. Faraz, I want to start off by, uh, by asking you what branding is to you. And I want to start there because it seems to me, I think it'd be fair to say that if you put five to 10 people in a room, maybe not at the moment, uh, but ask them what branding means to them, they'd all give different answers. So, so what is it to you? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, You'd be surprised by the number of people who think that branding is just, I guess, a logo and a strap line. Um, I think people have developed their thinking around branding a little bit more beyond that now, but it's still sort of the core element that people refer to. Um, but for me, branding is everything. Um, it's a fundamental beginning of how your company communicates, um, both to potential customers um, and also internally. Um, with employees uh, that you bring on. Um, and the beginnings of how to sort of create um, that brand ID isn't necessarily um, visualization or what is our logo, what do we look like, but it's actually your narrative. Um, what, is, what, is, what is your brand narrative? Um, there's no right framework, in my opinion, for defining a brand narrative, but I think it should always encapsulate some of the following. Um, your vision. Where are you going as a business? What is your sort of far-reaching ambition, that North Star that you're aiming for? Your mission. How are you going to get there? What is it that you are practically doing? Your values. How are you going to stay true to who you are as a brand? Your promise. What is it that takes you from a, hey, this is a really functional thing that this product or service does and makes it a bit more of an emotional pull? Your essence, how do you want people to feel when they come in contact with the brand, whatever touch point that is? Your tone of voice, how do you start speaking as a brand? Um, your story, that one sentence, the strap line. Um, I think the best brands have their narrative nailed. Um, they truly understand where they're going and what they are in the form of words um, before moving into a stage of starting to visualize that. Um, so to answer your question around about way, what is branding to me? It's the core fundamental beginnings of how a company needs to communicate. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and has that changed um, over time? Do you think? Because looking back over the you know the past five ten years, I, th I think what you said at the start there is it probably a lot more people did think it's your logo, it's your packaging. Has, has that shifted over the past decade towards more of what you were talking about, the mission, the narrative? I think I think it's not necessarily shifted, but we've just become more aware of it. Right. I think, you know, great brand IDs have always ex great brands have always existed. Um, we may not be aware of a brand's narrative, 
And actually, as consumers, one of the only touch points that we ever really see is the final output, right? It is the logo or it is the packaging. Um, so I don't think the the sort of a conversation around or sort of the, the thesis behind a branding, um, behind a brand has changed. I think the conversation has changed a little bit more. We're all far more acutely aware of it. Um, we all analyze it far more than we used to, you know, marketing and advertising and branding Twitter didn't exist sort of 10 years ago. Um, now it does. And now everyone talks about the new brands that are released. Why is this right? Why is this wrong? Um, everyone has two cents. Um, but I think, you know, when you, when you think about sort of where we are now, um, You know, from a from a sort of business perspective, whether it was 10 years ago, now, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, branding is still probably one of the most important investments that a company is going to make. Um, it gives you the opportunity to position yourself um, as an authoritative expert within your sector. It allows you to attract the right kind of com consumers and customers from the off if you get your brand right at the beginning it means you have to spend less on marketing in the long run um, and it overall should increase the perception of the company's value um, a great brand can really make you fly or make you sink um, yeah absolutely and do you think it's a case that because, I, as you said, consumers are so much more aware of uh, a company's values and its missions and things like that, do you think because consumers are more aware of it now that the whole narrative and visualisation of a brand is more important now than it was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? Definitely. And, and with the rise of sort of social media where you have eyeballs on your brand, not just in a sense of you can find me in store or here's one billboard. Now you have so many touch points as a brand um, and you have so many areas where you can be poked and prodded um, by consumers to sort of really question what you're saying, what you're selling. Um, and I think you just need to be more conscious of if we are going to build a brand narrative and build a brand to stand for something um, or not stand for something, but it is just the way it is, you've got to be aware that in this day and age, if you don't stick true to that, you know, people will come and people will call you out and they will happily do it. Um, and it could be a flippant comment on Instagram um, or it could be something far worse. Um, so it's just important to sort of know your narrative. Um, and know the reasons why your brand communicates or is the way it is. Um, you may have to justify that in the public realm um, far more than, than you had to sort of 30, 40 years ago, definitely. Yeah, and, and then looking, you know, closer to home in, in terms of the now in the past, what will be six or seven months, I think there's, there's been a lot of talk about people becoming a lot more aware of who they're shopping with, why they're shopping with, looking at local businesses and things like that and, and really caring about where they spend their money do you think it even even in this past seven months that it's become even more important than it was at the start of the year definitely but and, and, and i think that's it's, it's sort of you know a cultural shift that we see as well um people are sort of joining challenger brands on their journey um, which is beautiful to see. People are actively looking for alternatives um, because they have the world at their fingertips. Um, it's no longer a case of, you know, I can only buy the products that are available to me down the shop. It's now I can get this from anywhere in the world. Um, and more and more what we're seeing from an agency side is, you know, consumers are leading a behavioral change within brands, especially new brands that are coming into market, where things that may have been built in um, as an afterthought uh, by brands previously are now inherently built into their business structure and their business models um, and their business ethos. Um, and that's incredibly exciting for us as an agency, 
where not only are we creating the brands of the future, but you know, I'm of the opinion that through purchase comes power. Um, so if you're actively making a positive change um, within the world, however that may be, however big or small, um, to help bring that to life and to help communicate that, you know, for us is like a huge deal. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and something that you touched on there, um, talking about uh, challenger brands having that mission and value set from from the very start. I imagine it's going to be a lot easier for a company and for, for agencies like yourselves to develop that brand from the outset. How difficult is it for a big company that's been been going, you know, however many decades that's established as well? How how difficult is it to actually change that brand? It's a really good question. I think it would be the wrong strategic advice to change that brand. Now, now, now let, let me try to sort of explain that and sort of wind that back. I think, yep, there are moments where you will need to rebrand and that will probably be because of a PR disaster uh, where all sense of trust has sort of been lost in the company and you need a bit of a fresh start. We offer the same service, however, it's just in a new shape or mold or name or form. But for a brand that's been going for a number of years, they've built brand equity. They've built brand equity in the name. They've built brand equity in the color palettes that they use. You know, if I say to you, uh, blue gradient with bubbles, um, you're going to say back to me, the company that does it, which is? My mind's gone blank. Blue, bubble. tele blue bubbles, telecoms, blue gradient, bubbles rising up. No, that's fine. It's O2. I, I won't use that example again. But, yeah, but do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a case of, you know, they've built so much equity around that key core visual. For an agency to come in and go, right, um, you're no longer that. We're gonna, well, you're going to be a pink elephant um, with a phone strap to it here. It's going to be your new sort of visual motif or sort of core uh, visual that we pull out. Would not be paying um, homage to the work that's already been done by the marketers, by the brand, to get to a stage where people are starting to recognize them. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because it's also not so easy when you come in and there's nothing to work with either. Um, occasionally, that, that sort of deep initial research, those key conversations that you have with stakeholders are so important because this brand hasn't been brought to life anywhere. It might be sort of, you know, in a Google Doc somewhere where you have some mission, vision, and values sort of written out two years ago before you got distracted by actually launching the product and the business. Um, but it's never been encapsulated um, and it's never been communicated necessarily, which makes our jobs just as difficult um, when we're trying to sort of think, okay, how does this brand come to life? Sometimes it's nice having slight restrictions um, of actually this is what we believe you know for example okay two examples disney and volvo um throughout their sort of brand life cycles disney wants you to feel magic volvo wants you to feel safe now wherever you come in contact with that disney brand it's all about magic whether it's through their identity whether it's in their shops whether it's in their products whether it's in their parks whether it's through their advertising um it's it's always magic and then volvo you know there's a reason why they shoot a car sort of driving very slowly through uh snow-peaked uh mountains um there's a reason why their advertising are sort of years gone by um, was always quite simple and matter of fact. Um, so they came with they come with essences that that still hold true. Now the execution of those might change, but that core feeling and that core essence sort of stays the same. Um, so I think you know pay, you have to stay true to the brand's narrative, um, whether that's a brand that's coming into you uh, sort of 30 years down the line and wants a bit of a refresh and an update. Um, or a brand that's sort of starting out now, um, you need to really sort of hone in on what that narrative is um, before you can start exploring what that looks like. Okay, that's it. Yeah, really, uh, really interesting answer there. And so obviously we, we all know that we've got 
so many businesses competing to sell us their products and services than ever before. They've got more ways of doing that. How on earth do you stand out, whether whether you're brand new to the market or you're just starting to, to kick off? How do you stand out in this market? Yeah. <laughs> standing out. I think, look, I think... Let me let me come let me come back to standing out. But before that, I think you know people need to not also forget about the core cool fundamentals of marketing, or which branding definitely sort of plays an element or plays a part in all of that. But there is standing out. But at, behind that all is you know the product. You can have the best packaging in the world, the best brand identity, but if the product is rubbish. Um, yeah, fine, you might attract new customers, but they're not going to be repeat purchases. They're not going to keep using you or keep buying you. Then you have price. You know, No one will buy you, no matter how great the brand is, if you haven't thought about sort of the overall market, your pricing, your promotions, um, et cetera. Then there's promotion in itself, You know, promotion, just sort of conventional communication of the brand. Um, there's no point having a great brand if no one can see it. Um, it's linked to placement as well. You know, there's no point having a great brand if no one can buy it. Um, fortunately for us in this day and age, you know, we're not dependent on a few sort of distribution channels anymore. Um, we now have, and I said, our own platforms. We can control um, the marketing funnel. Um, and actually, you can launch a brand if you really wanted to. Um, in sort of in a matter of weeks, um, where you can go from start to finish and selling online um, quite quickly. How do you stand out within all this? Um, well, you make sure you learn from your competition. I think competitor analysis is one of the most important things that you can do because it's sort of like revising, if that makes sense. You're using uh, material that already exists um, and to come at it going no 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 I'm not going to look at anyone I'm just going to sort of do my own thing feels like a naive thing to do right because the reason why your competitors exist still as businesses is because they've been doing something right um, whether it's talking uh, talking about a product in a specific way whether it's sort of harnessing a particular community in a specific way um, there's a reason why they still exist and there's a reason why you've got them in your sort of eyesight um, but look at your competitors, learn from them, but never be like them. I think in um, a sea of brands, it's naive to be bland. Um, you know, there's no point uh, looking, being wallpaper. There's no point um, looking and acting and sounding like everyone else. So what I would always sort of say to our clients is, you know, Yes, we will look at the competition and learn from them. But to get us out of sort of the mindset of what everyone else is doing, we will look outside of your category. We would look to bring in inspiration, not from your world. Actually, we might want to explore something completely different that may have a link back to what we do. Um, you know, I, th I think just really quickly, I think a really good example of this is actually made.com. Right. So they were uh, one of the first brands to, no, not one of the first. They are a very new brand that sells furniture. There have been many brands that have sold furniture um, previously to them. However, they came in with a tone of voice and aesthetic and a big media budget. That always helps. Um, and they sort of went, hey, look, here we are. This is who we are. This is what we look like. Um, and people got used to them. The competition started looking at them and going, God, yeah, made doing something great. And they started rolling out ads that looked like made. They had the new tones, they had the styling pretty much similar. And actually what they're doing there by reinforcing made's visual is just making people think of made. Um, they're, not, they're not getting across that their habitat or the numerous other competitors that are now sort of entering the market. But by copying Maid's aesthetic and thinking, right, yeah, this is this is the way to tap into that market, they're just reinforcing sort of Maid's credentials. Um, compare that to someone like uh, within their category, Loaf, um, who do their own thing. 
who have their own aesthetic, who have their own comms and their own purpose and their own position. Um, and they're not afraid to sort of communicate that. Um, but yeah, I think I think the made.com example is a good one. I wish I had some visual references behind me rather than our clients' posters. Yeah, and, and just touching on, on that there, um, you mentioned about brands effectively copying each other. Um, do you find that branding as a concept kind of goes through cycles and trends in that sense? And, and forgive me for anyone who's not a, a football fan or anything like that, but it almost reminds me of football formations where someone brings out a new formation, plays a certain way, and everyone goes, hey, that's working. Everyone starts to copy it. Everyone starts playing the same way, and eventually it kind of dies out because it starts not working anymore, and then someone has to think of something new. So do you see those kind of cycles in branding? I think I think the trends question is such a sort of fascinating one, and, and I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with it because a trend is culture right a trend is something that we are all living in culturally and there's a reason why you see particular executions that feel familiar familiar for familiar 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 within uh within certain time frames you know right now that 90s grunge aesthetic is very much back in um whether it's in fashion or in design um it's there but you know, I don't. I, I I think that's because you know we all live in the same cultural moment, so of course we're going to pick up on the same references, and of course we're going to pick up on the same bits of inspiration without even necessarily realizing it. Um, so yes, you do sometimes get trendy executions, but branding is not styling. You know, going back to what is the fundamental core truth of that brand, that narrative is so important. The visual anchors that you build out within that branding process are so important. Those shouldn't necessarily change in terms of brand comps, brand ID comps. Where you might want to tap into trends and what's culturally relevant is through your advertising. That's where I think, you know, you have an opportunity um, to sort of be of the zeitgeist. Um, you know, you don't want to be in a position where your brand is dictated by the winds of change. Um, otherwise, you'll be having to go through a rebrand every two years. Um, and every time you do that, you lose brand equity. Yeah, and, and focusing a little bit more on the, on the mission and value side of it, how, how difficult is it to almost stay ahead of that curve because as i was just saying you know, let's take um sustainability sustainability is massive for challenger brands for for, uh, for multinational businesses at the moment at the kind of start of that trend if you want to call it a trend that's right yeah that business has got sustainability sustainability at the heart of what they do i love that business i'm going to follow that journey after a period of however many years all of a sudden every single company starts talking about we value sustainability we do this this is what we're doing for that cause it then almost devalues it for for those ones who, who were there at the beginning of the journey is so how do you kind of stay ahead of that curve i think i think you, you can't stay ahead of the curve because it's something that's a value that's inherently built in you know um I think what, what you can do is communicate that your values, that, that's where the staying ahead of the curve comes in. It's in the communication of those values rather than the value itself. I think, brilliant. If I'm a sustainable business, I'm a sustainable business owner who has inherently got sustainability um, built into my business, and then I start seeing um, other brands doing it, I, I would feel a sense of pride and a sense of, you know what, actually we're doing the right thing and the more people that we have with us doing this will be brilliant. Um, your point of difference though might be lost, right? Um, and I think that's, that's the question we're trying to draw in on. But you know, there are tons of ways that you can communicate your point of difference. E-cover, really good example. Um, being a sustainable brand uh, for sort of 30, 40 odd years, um, no, you know, sales weren't high. Um, until about maybe 10 years ago, six, seven years ago. Um, 
when sort of the environmental aspects started playing into sort of consumers' purchase decisions. Um, and then they ran a great campaign sort of a, sort of a year and a half ago, which was, uh, you know, sustainable before it was cool. Um, and they harked back to their initial sustainability ethos and why they did it, um, et cetera, um, which I thought was a really lovely way to not sort of have to define a new set of values and beliefs, but a great way of just communicating sort of their inherent values and beliefs just in a slightly different time. Okay, and, and um, I think change, uh, change the direction slightly um, here. Uh, so entrepreneurs is very much what we're about as the Great British Entrepreneur Awards. It's about their story. Um, and we're kind of increasingly seeing that become a big, big part of a business's narratives, um, particularly for you know startups and independent businesses. Do you think that we'll see more of that going forward in, in the wider world and, and even in bigger businesses as well? Yeah, I think I think there's a I think it's I think for small businesses it's a need and a requirement. Um, SMEs don't have huge media budgets. Um, and it means that they have to find ways to increase reach through probably more, 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 more than any other businesses through earned media um, or through sort of press and PR. And, but unfortunately, again, they don't have huge budgets for press and PR. Um, but founders are free. Um, there's something that you can roll out um, over and over again. Um, but not only are they a sort of free tool for a brand to use, in a so, so, sorry, everyone here, um, not only are they a free tool for a brand to use, but they provide a platform and an ability to bring a bit of a human face to the brand. So going back to that first thing that we first spoke about, which is challenge of brands and why people are buying into them. They bring a bit of authenticity um, and they allow you to sort of make a bit more noise than you should be able to. I mean, just look at Branson in his heyday. Now I'm not talking about Virgin now, but sort of Virgin 30 years ago, Rich Branson was on everything, tanks, parachutes, balloons, you name it, he was doing it. Um, and that got him on media. Elon Musk now to an, extent, to an extent as well, uses himself and his platform to promote whatever he's doing. I do think it's gonna be, I think it's an, I think it's an incredibly important tool for SMEs. Um, and I think you know more and more what we're seeing is founders knowing this, um, and founders knowing that they will have to play a part in the marketing mix um, and wanting training to become the best that they possibly can in doing it. Um, because, you know, they also provide a voice um, and a slightly different perspective um, that a brand may have not otherwise been able to afford to tell to a wider audience. Um, people like humans. Um, and they, yeah. yeah and and just, I'm uh, just curious. Um, have you had any founders uh, come to you and say, "My business branding is is sorted. Help me work on my branding." Yeah, yeah. And I think um, we have. And you know, the idea of personal branding. Oh God, I, I hate that term. Um, you know, it's 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 just you know we see it as another brief. Um, the founder, in that essence, or that sort of becomes a becomes a channel or a product in itself, and it's right. Okay, how do we define their narrative? It might be slightly different to the businesses. Um, what do they talk about? Um, and it's sort of helping them discover what it is because it can't be forced either. Um, it has to come from them. It just occasionally needs to be weaned out um, slowly. Yeah, and, and so um, we've touched a little bit uh, there about the, the process. Um, so let's go on, on to that, that aspect of things. Talk me through the, the journey um, of developing a brand right from square one to the fully finished, the ready ready to go out to the world. Part. How long you got? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, do your research, number one. Uh, figure out who your customers are, who your competitors are, uh, going back to the customers, what is it that they want? 
Why is it that they would not potentially buy you? Uh, why is it that they may potentially buy you? Um, number two, make sure your product is good. Uh, I'm not asking for it to be perfect, but good. I don't think perfection, you will ever get there. I think that's sort of very much an iterative process, uh, but make sure it's good. Um, we haven't even touched on branding yet, but that's what I would expect from sort of the people that we work with. They've done their research and their product is good. Now, right, okay, going into helping the brand communicate that, the narrative, that beginning bit. We know who our customers are, we know what they want, we know who we are, we know the competition, uh, we know our product is good. Um, okay, great, let's start defining that narrative, mission, vision, values, essence, promise, tone of voice. Brilliant. So we look for sign off on that brand narrative with a client before we do anything. Um, because we just want to all be sure that we're all coming from the same place. So we have signed off on the brand narrative. Now we're like, now we tap into the brand essence. How do we want people to feel? Because that's actually going to dictate our visual cues and anchors far more than our mission, vision, and values. Because that sense of feeling, you know, if I say to you, um, I want you to feel safe it's going to sort of bring up a range of different images in your mind than if I say to you, I want you to feel magic. Um, so harnessing that brand essence allows us to start developing mood boards of um, references that already exist. Right, so now we know we want to say magic uh, or we want people to feel magic. How can we show magic? Well, actually, there are tons of different ways that we can show magic. Um, and we start exploring that with the client. So we start looking at mood boards that have magic at the heart of them, but have individual concepts within each one. Right, this is one way to show magic. This is another, and this is the third. You work through that with your, uh, with your clients. Um, you start to understand a little bit more about what their, where their minds are at, and they start to understand a little bit more about sort of where you're thinking of taking the brand. And I think between sort of narrative and, hey, here's a... Um, first logo iteration, there's, there's that sort of gray zone of what, you know, and I think the mood boarding process helps make sure that that gray zone, you know, isn't too far removed um, and isn't doesn't become too of a surprise when, you know, the agency comes back and goes, na -na, um, and the founder's sitting there going, why have you done this? Like, why, well, I can't understand why we're here. Um, and I think that mood boarding phase is so important because it, again, brings you back together, shows them what you want to do, show, and it also allows you to interrogate them a little bit. Um, so we have mood boarding. So what tends to happen is that uh, we like elements from different mood boards. Um, and then it's our job to take that thinking and to distill it into a coherent identity. Um, taking that sort of mood board concept we will start to flesh out what that core ID starts to look like, right? The logo, the color palettes that we want to tap into, the typography that we use. But then beyond that, we want to start figuring out outside of your key cause brand touch point, you know, if you're a brand that sells, if you're an FMCG brand, yeah, packaging, of course, it's going to sort of be very much at the forefront of our mind. If you're a app-based brand, of course, you know, we're, we're conscious of where you're going to be applied, but Beyond your core, I guess, uh, products that, that we need to sell, you also need to start figuring out what that wider brand world looks like. As I said, you know, you have so many touch points as a brand these days. Um, you don't want to be in a position where you have to run an ad in two days' time for a trade magazine and you're there going, God, what does this ad look like? Or what do we say? Um, and you're there desperately pulling bits and bobs from different areas and trying to sort of formulate something that feels coherent um, and feels like you. Um, so that brand world development area of, right, looking at all of the touch points, you are going to be available to consumers or to people as a brand, both internally, by the way, and externally. You know, there are a lot of culture newsletters that we take on board as part of our branding jobs. Um, and just sort of mapping those out and letting your agency partners know that actually this is everywhere we need to communicate and we need to know how should we be communicating? What are the core uh, brand visual anchors that we're pulling out of each touch point? Um, and sort of delving into that is incredibly important. So narrative uh, research products, 
narrative, mood boards, brand ID development, brand world development, um, and then application. So, you know, um, that final piece um, of actually bringing the brand to life. It looked great on a PDF, um, but brands aren't built in a PDF. Um, so bringing that brand to life, you know, you need to work with um, whatever the sort of product is in the end of it, but, you know, you need to work with the people who are going to be building that product out, whether it is your sort of packaging firm or whether it is your um, developers for your app, um, to make sure that it's consistent to your original vision. Um, did I did I waffle on too long there? No, not. I mean, I, I knew full well asking the question that it was going to be uh, going to be a long one, and uh, um, yeah, I, I think that kind of summarised it quite well. Um, and just touching on that, do, is there a kind of a, a a list of things that when you're looking at something like the mission or the the essence, are there things that you say to a client? it has to have this or it, it cannot have this is there the, those kind of not checklist but that kind of kind of do's and don'ts side of uh, branding yeah i think i think you know i think we would never go into a room and go look your mission vision and values it must say it must encapsulate this or it must not i think it would be uh it would be quite rude of us to do so a little bit, just because as an agency partner, you know, we, we have X amount of contact time with a brand. Um, and actually, you know, we, have, we haven't thought about it as much as the founders have or as the teams have internally as a brand. Um, so, you know, what we aim to do is we aim to tap into something that exists there already in one form or another. Um, and to bring that out and to help succinctly communicate that. I think, you know, that's the job of the agency partner when it's the, your mission, vision and values. Um, if they come to you and go, you know, this is your vision, Brand X, and this is your mission, it just feels odd um, because, you know, who the hell am I to tell you what your vision and mission is? But I, what I can do is help communicate that or whatever you are thinking to make it a bit more of a consumer facing or more succinct interpretation of it. Um, general do's and don'ts, um, do you know your customers? Uh, don't bracket them as millennials, I hate that. Um, I think, you know, uh, I, I know grannies who listen to grime music and I know 21 year olds who do knitting. Um, just no matter, it doesn't matter how old you are, you all have different behaviors and interests. Um, do you know how to sell your product or what makes you different or that point of difference? But don't sell a lie because you're not going to have longevity there. Um, do have a vision, make it far reaching um, and don't be afraid to tell it and talk about it, whether it's internally or externally. Um, and do know the feeling. And, and I always go back to this. It's that feeling, that essence that you are always trying to bring out with your comms, whether it's your ID your digital ad or that social media post. Just know the feeling that you're trying to build with this brand um, and don't stray away from it. And you, you touched there on um, the kind of relationship that you have with your clients. When you're working with, uh, with a company, I can imagine that there's a lot of disagreements when you're really diving into the, to the core of, of what they're trying to do and how it's going to look to the world. Is it better for you... Um, and, and for the client on, on, the, on the business side of it, to work with someone who really share, shares the same ideas and values, or does it kind of, is it a bit more productive to actually work with someone who's got different ideas and can pull you out of your comfort zone and challenge your thinking? Yeah. Uh, I thought, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm gonna reference Dave Trot here. And if no one has read Dave Trot's books, um, I would definitely recommend to do so. Um, they're brilliantly written, they're very short, they're very succinct. Um, and I'm not paid by him to do his promo, but I just think he's, he's a great way to sort of get into the mindset a little bit. Um, and he said something brilliant that's always stuck with me, which is we are not the target market, so we're not important. Um, so to answer that question, I, I think it's not necessarily about values um, when you're working with a partner. I think it's a little bit about respect. 
So I, as a business owner, I respect you. Um, and I respect the fact that you will know more about me about your business, or you know more than me about your business than I ever will. Um, I will respect what you've done and how you've done it to get to where you are. I will try and learn as much as I can um, in a condensed amount of time about what makes you, you. But also as your sort of partner, I come from a really privileged position when the first time I approach a brand, the first time I inter interrogate it, is also where actually a lot of consumers are going to be when they first come in contact with the brand. So I'm going to be able to offer a fresh perspective um, on something along with a sort of vast knowledge, I don't know, uh, a bit of knowledge around sort of uh, the outer world and how brands should communicate. So I expect respect, I, I expect my clients to be respected by our team, but I also expect our clients to respect us and our expertise. Um, and, you know, disagreements aren't bad. Disagreements are actually where, you know, if you're all nodding along in the room, I think there's something wrong with that. I think, I think, you know, yes, finally, in the end goal, if we're all like, yes, absolutely, this is it, brilliant. And we're all nodding, amazing. But if we're all nodding in, at the start, like sort of Churchill the dog, uh, it feels like we're not interrogating it enough. Actually, I want a bit of dysfunction, even within the team here at, at the Clark and Well Brothers. I want disagreement because disagreement means probing and prodding and exploring something that we may not have done before. And hey, that route might go down somewhere where it nothing happens from it, but it might lead on to something else, which is a bit of a tangent from it, but we can only get to because we couldn't agree on something. Um, I'm always surprised, by the way, of the amount of clients that we come uh, that, that that come through our door going, we loved what you did for X. We want to do something completely similar. Um, and I'm, I'm always surprised because if I were a business owner, I would want a fresh perspective. I understand the sort of safe hands and, hey, they've done it before, therefore they'll do it again. Um, but I don't know. I'm, 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 always, I'm always perplexed by that. But, hey, my new business guy doesn't mind. So... <laughs> Um, and just uh, just for clarity uh, for, for the audience, um, that was Dave Trott. And what was the name of the book, sorry? Uh, he's got loads, and I would recommend reading all of them. Okay. Um, but that one came from uh, 2 plus 2 equals 3, or 1 plus 1 equals 3. I can't remember. But Dave Trott, quite cheap um, to buy. Uh, really good read, really short. And you can just pick it up whenever you want. Uh, excellent, and I think um, I think Chloe has uh, really uh, really helpfully popped that in the uh, in the chat for us there. Um, so we've just got a couple uh, minutes left. Um, I just ask, obviously, a lot of uh, you've, you've talked about the importance of getting your branding right from the very start. There's so many businesses that are starting that haven't necessarily got the budget to come to an agency. What advice would you give them if they, in, a, in essence, having to do it themselves? Can I say don't? Uh, um, no, I think I think I'll go, I'll go back to it being one of the most com important commercial decisions you will make as a business owner. If you are willing to invest money in the product that you are making, um, you should be willing to invest money in the brand that's going to be out there. That's going to be the first touch point that anyone ever has with you. Um, if you're not in a position to be able to do that or to work with an agency, I would still recommend not doing it yourself, um, but tapping into freelancers or tapping into people who have done it before. Fine, you don't have a whole team doing it, but make sure you have a professional doing it. You know, I wouldn't go to my electrician and ask him to fix my boiler. Um, and I don't expect business owners to know how to sort of create a brilliant brand ID. But what sets a great brand up is probably the brief um, that, that, that either an agency receives or that a freelancer receives or even, dare I say it, someone on Fiverr, but maybe not, but hopefully not, but whatever. You, you, get, you, get, you get what I mean. Um, and different people will have different briefing formats. Um, you know, I always say to people sort of around the briefing question, how do you brief? Well, actually, everyone has a very different briefing style. Um, I can happily share 
sort of ours with 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 the sort of cohorts here um, and to show them what the kind of questions that we ask um, if that's useful um, but it's working with whoever you're working to understand what they want from their side of the brief um, from your end you need to know what you what you want your output to be um, you need to know what your budget is or isn't um, and you need to know your timelines in place uh, you need to know your timelines um, yesterday is never a great timeline, um, even though we do hear that a fair bit. People go, gosh, yeah, I need this done ASAP. But, you know, we can't always do that. Um, and knowing that the brief that you create or you set is supposed to be a um, platform to jump off of um, rather than necessarily something to restrict you. Um, or restrict the people doing the work um, is always a sort of a good place to be in mentally too. Well, for us, uh, I think we've we've really unfortunately run out of time, um, and that actually that actually answered my what was going to be my last question. So, so thank you for that. Um, but yeah, it's been really really interesting talking to you today. And um, yeah, and if if you could share your your brief ideas uh, with us to to share with everyone watching, that would be fantastic. Um, but it's been really interesting talking to you. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and I will pass back to Chloe. No worries. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Thank you both for joining us today and sharing your expertise and knowledge. What a fantastic session. You can join us our next light bulb session at the same time next Thursday. And we'll be joined by Peter Kelly from Employable as we discuss, could you make a four day week work for your business? If there is anything you'd like to catch upon from today's session, we'll be sending out a replay of the recording later today. You can find the replay and future sessions at www.lightbulb-sessions.haysummit.com or by clicking on the link in the comment section. Lots of lovely comments coming in in the chat saying thank you so much, super useful, great session. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today and thank you again for us and Jonathan. Goodbye, everybody.